Yep. Sorry, apologies for Charlie not being, he's not well, so I'll try and give you some idea of his slides as we go through. So we're really just going to talk about the journey today and a bit of the technology behind it and then a quick demo. So I'm not an archivist, but I've always seen the archives as complex relationships, repositories of complex relationships, especially when you're dealing with people's lives, stories, interactions between people and government. And it's always occurred to me, because I think spatially and in pictures, why do we reduce these complex relationships to lists, which give you no idea of the relationships. They're just lists of entities, such as functions, series, agencies. Especially when we've got the ability to visualise these relationships. And when these relationships are as complex as some of the neural path networks that go through a person's brain. So I'll give you a quick rundown of my journey to the development of the tool, and then I'll quickly show you Charlie's journey, which coincides. So it was about 2010 that I came across a template for Excel, um, developed by the Social Media Foundation, Mark Smith in the States. And I simply just want to take a small part of the archive, which is the Chief Sex Department, and just look at the, um, the series coming out of that agency. So I used this Excel template and I had come up with this very crude, unsexy, confusing visualisation. And it's purely looking at the chief sex department and all the series coming out. And then four years later, I came across a Google Fusion Table web service which allowed you to produce a bit more of a sophisticated visualisation of the same data, chief sex again, with all the series, about 200 series it created. So here you've just got the chief sex at the middle, you've got the series around the sides, you've got some labels. The only problem with this is that you can't hyperlink from any of those entities and you can't do a sophisticated search. And those limitations made me think, well, I've got to get in touch with a developer so we can do a custom-made bespoke model. And that's when I thought of Connell. I'd met him previously at a, that camp in Canberra, got in touch with Connell, and he'd been doing a lot of work with archives and academic institutions across Australia for some time. And we came up with the very first version of a custom made visualisation. Let me see if I can get to that. So we had a basic search here and a year filter. And then we had agencies in yellow. And we hadn't actually mapped a series at level at this stage. It's really for first time researchers at this level who have no idea what an archive is, what we have, what we don't have. To save them spending hundreds of hours looking for stuff we simply don't have, they might be looking for information on things like water. Are there any archival records to do with water? And we quickly see there's some functions, big functions to do with water, some agencies, but still at this early stage of the prototype, very ugly, unsophisticated, confusing, um, not user-friendly at all, not accessible, not inviting, not engaging. So that's when we started the whole user acceptance testing process, trying to work out what people actually needed from this experience and how to give it to them best. And that was internally in the archives, but also a lot of external you know, stakeholders from the right up through the continuum for people who had no idea what an archive was to people who were making money as research agents. So that was my journey. And Charlie started a similar sort of journey. He was specifically looking in 2011 for a visualisation that could help him map um, administrative changes, changes, machinery of government changes over time from the colonial period in Victoria right through to the present day. As you know, Charlie, if anyone knows Charlie here, he's got this passion for music, unbelievable passion for music. He should actually be working for Triple R. He started looking at things called Rock Connections by Brendan MacDonald. It was a book, so it's not interactive, just a, an image. And he was looking at various ways of visualising music genres and the other things like artists, relationships between bands, that kind of stuff. And then thinking, could you actually use this sort of model for um, visualising functions and agencies? He wasn't thinking at series level at all. He was purely looking at a way to visualise those very big picture entities. Then he came across an online web service in iTunes called Discover, where you could simply do a Google type search 
and find the relationships between bands. And every single one of those nodes or bands, you could do a search on and find further relationships between those bands and other bands. Now, could this be applied to an archival setting where you want to give first-time researchers an idea of relationships between functions, agencies, series, and then hopefully take them straight back into the online catalogue where they can learn more about those entities on a landing page and hopefully find some records. He then went into Excel and he broke Excel because he just had too much data in it. So it started losing colours, labels, that sort of thing. So he was very, I think, excited about breaking Excel. So that was Charlie's non-tech savvy attempt because it wasn't sustainable, it wasn't scalable. This was all just manual data he was fitting into Excel. There was no data dynamically coming into any system. He found out what I was doing and we basically started working with Connell. And that's where Connell comes in next. And then after we hear from Connell about the tech, we'll do a demo of the finished product we have today. Thanks, Osa. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to show you a couple of slides about uh, the, some of the technology. Um, in general, the, um, the visualisation really consists of two parts. There's a back end and a front end. Um, in the early days, we, the, the back end, the actual data that was being visualised, had been genera generated by Charlie Frugia. He had actually generated this stuff himself by running various reports um, and you know, collating it, the results together into a, into a spreadsheet, a CSV, or a couple of CSV files. And the visualisation then was a, a piece of HTML and JavaScript uh, which read those CSV files into your browser and, and displayed and allowed you to search and, and, and navigate your way around that graph. Um, and so the, the, the first uh, visualisation, which Asa showed just a few minutes ago, um, that was built um, to, to interpret those CSV files that Charlie had created manually. Um, but w once we'd got a bit further along through the process, we realised that, um, you know, that that early prototype of the user interface would need to be enhanced, and, but also more, more crucially that the, the prototype of the back end would need to be developed as well, um, because that kind of manual work, it took Charlie a lot, lot of time to generate that data. Um, that's really not a sustainable you know, effort. Um, but what we found was that it was possible for us to automate the creation of that CSV um, data um, in a way that would enable us to keep, a, keep the visualisation up to date and so that as new, uh, new series are created and so on in the, uh, in the PROV's um, archival control system, um, those changes would flow through and appear in the visualisation, you know, in a matter of, not instantly, but in a matter of a few days. Um, so what I'm going to show you here, these next couple of slides, are about the, the back end and, and where we went to replace that manual process with, a, with an automated one. So what we started off was um, recognising that Prof had uh, an existing open data publication system. A few years previously to our work, um, this system had been established uh, under the auspices of the Australian National Data Service. Um, and the Australian National Data Service, ANS, they have a, a portal um, of data sets um, that are available to researchers. And so they harvest metadata about these data sets um, from all kinds of repositories, uh, data repositories across the country. Um, and one of these repositories, of course, is um, the, the Public Record Office. Um, because from a, from a certain point of view, although most of the data sets in the ANS portal are, you know, scientific things, um, you know, there's kind of sensor networks and there are, you know, there's the Australian synchrotron and so on, a lot of uh, very high-tech, um, you know, physical science data sets. Um, these archival uh, series and so on are also, um, you know, important research data sets. And so they were, in a way, wedged into the same kind of framework as the, um, as the scientific data sets. Um, and the way that was done was uh, that the, the individual uh, entities, which were uh, agents, you know, research organisations, researchers and so on, uh, research programs and uh, research data sets, um, were recorded in XML files using, a, uh, using a, an XML format called RIFCS, um, which it's about uh, collections and services. It's a registry interchange format, collections and services. There we go, I can remember it. Um, so it turned out that these, that these entities that were described in RIFCS um, were, if you looked at them in the right way, very much the same kind of entities that were kind of core entities in PROV's own data model. You know, these um, uh, collections um, were series. Um, uh, you know, the, 
the research programs were governmental functions um, because these you know, series were produced in the, in the carrying out of functions and so on. So there was quite a straightforward mapping. And what Prof had done then is taken data, a data dump, from their archival control system, exported it out into RIFCS XML, um, and then exposed it to the web using this uh, software on the, on the right there called the Open Archives Metadata Repository. Um, uh, the OAIPMH is Open Archives Initiative Protocol for Metadata Harvesting, and it's a standard that um, provides a mechanism for um, bulk exchange of, of metadata of some sort. And so that metadata then was harvested by the, um, the National Data Service and also then by Trove. Um, and so this was already available to us at the point where we were looking for a way to get some updated data. And so what we thought was, well, we could just hook straight into that ourselves. And so this is kind of an odd thing in a sense. We've got, um, we've got Prof with their own database exporting the data and publishing it on the web and then harvesting, reaching out into the web, harvesting that data themselves and processing it further. So that's the next slide. Uh, it shows the data pipeline, which is the back end of the provisualizer as it is now. So on the left there, you've got the, um, the repository of RIFCS XML records. Um, they are harvested by a piece of software, which I wrote under contract to Prov. Um, and the output of that software is, you know, it downloads all of these records from the, from the repository, converts them all into RDF graphs, and then it stores all those graphs in a Sparkle graph store. Now, it's simply a matter of just throwing the graphs into the store. Um, once they're in the store, all of those little graphs, which represent some little part of the overall network, you know, this entity and a few related entities, next graph will represent this entity and a few other related entities. You throw all the graphs together into your Sparkle store and all those graphs merge together. And where, where entities have been identified with the same identifier, they actually, they, they unify, they merge. Um, and so you end up then with a, with, a, with a network that contains the entire, I don't know how many it was, 30,000, I think springs to mind, um, entities. So then what happens is that Sparkle store is queryable. You can write little kind of database queries to it um, and retrieve data out of it according to whatever criteria you have. So we then we generated those very same CSV files that had been previously generated manually and straight into the provisualizer and displayed. So a few interesting factors I think about the, um, to, to, to mention about the way that we organized this work and, and um, uh, you know, assembled the system. Uh, the enterprise architecture of the system, what, was, what really drove these decisions. Um, for a start, although we, we're using this uh, semantic web technology, RDF, you know, graph databases, whatever you want to call it, um, that's not something that's typically found, uh, you know, a lot of expertise um, in institutions. It's quite a, quite a high-tech thing. Um, you find that there's support for that inside universities and so on, but it's, it's not quite yet, I think, mainstream. And I think this is where the, the ICA's work on uh, records and context um, is potentially a real game changer because it, I think it'll it'll make that technology become mainstream and, and you know be be seen as mainstream. So Prov also has a strategy to move their uh, applications into the cloud uh, rather than maintaining things in their own local data centre, um, and that's a good strategy I think, particularly when you're dealing with large scale. Uh, by moving things into the cloud, you can easily, much more cheaply, scale up to meet demand if you have a very successful product. The last thing you want is to have your successful product brought to its knees by having too many people trying to access it at once. By putting it into the cloud, you can, you can scale right up um, just by paying a few more dollars to, to Amazon or whoever is providing your cloud service. Uh, the other point about relying on the OAI PMH feed, while we're getting data from the public OAI PMH feed, um, rather than directly from the um, archival control system, is that the archival control system is potentially you know, it's under review, uh, things can change. Um, if we have a dependency on that software and things change, then we've got to change something to match. Um, but because the OAI PMH uh, repository is, if you like, a kind of a contract or it's a commitment that, that Prov has effectively made to the National Library and to the Australian National Data Service, um, if they're going to continue to offer that service, if they change their um, archival control software, are they going to have to continue to provide that same service? And so things can change behind the scenes, but so long as that service is provided, we're going to be OK and we'll be insulated from any of those changes that might otherwise be disruptive. So the final thing I'd say about um, the, the technology before we get into the, um, the demonstration of the visualisation is the use of linked data. Um, there, if I, if I just skip back 
couple of slides. There, that Sparkle Graph Store, that is the key technology here. Um, this is a database in which data is modelled as a graph, I, as a network, in other words. Um, and that technology is something quite new, um, but it is something that's enormously powerful, and I think it's something that, you know, although there were alternative ways that we could have approached this, this process, by using linked data, it purely as an intermediate, you know, as a, as a step in our pipeline, um, we now have the potential to actually expose that linked data to all sorts of other uses as well. Um, I think it's a very flexible approach, um, and it's an approach in particular that allows for the, the prov metadata to be linked to metadata from a whole lot of other sources, any number of other sources, could be integrated with it um, very easily. And I think this is the real strength of the linked data platform as a kind of, as a set of software technologies, um, is that it allows, very much facilitates the integration of knowledge from disparate sources. Um, so in particular, we were talking um, quite a lot about um, building a federated search. Um, this could very much be part of you know, Prov's contribution to a federated search. Um, that Sparkle store gives you the opportunity for researchers to submit arbitrary queries to it, looking for information about you know, connections, all kinds of different things could potentially be extracted from that. And by storing it all in one central queryable database, we've, we've provided a lot of flexibility to researchers who might want to approach the, the archives you know, from, a, from a very high level, or be able to drill down in, in whatever way suits them. Uh, the other things that we could do about it um, is using it as a way, which we haven't yet, of enhancing Prov's existing website. So if, for instance, there's a page on the Access the Collection website about a series, for instance, um, we could bring into that page information that's been taken from the Sparkle store um, about related entities and display them right there on that page. So it's a way that could support you know, a, a kind of contextualisation um, in the form of simple little plugins that you could do with a little couple of lines of JavaScript. So again, it's very much a, a technology that's oriented towards um, modern web design techniques, very much about plugging things in where needed and, and reusing them across a wide, a wide uh, surface of the web. So I think that's it for the, the technology. We should move on to the, the fun graph demo. Yeah. Okay, so the albatross is finally off my neck. The PowerPoint is gone. Let's get on to the actual demo. So here's the visualisation and... Might be interesting criminal trial briefs, as you are. And then we'll get a bigger view of that. And we can we see we've got three agencies, three series. And clicking on any of those will take us to access the collection. So for a first time researcher, it's a really easy way to get into those records without having to specifically know about 19th century record keeping practice or citations or language such as series and that kind of stuff. They're almost doing a kind of a keyword search. And then on that landing page you've got all the details about the series that you need. How to actually access. Or you might be interested in a really big subject like photographic collections. So you rock up to Prov and go, geez, I wonder if Prov's got any photographic collections. I wonder if there are like a library or museum where you can just do a Google search like photographic collections. Nah, that'd be about 20 years away, surely. <laughs> and yes, it is 20 years away. Yeah, let's make this a bit easier. And here we can see we've got 76 photographic collection series created by 35 agencies. And the bigger and darker a circle, the more connections it has.
So this is a pretty big connected series here. Our State Electricity Commission with all those different series coming off it. And to get a better view, we can just go to Zoom to Fit. And then we get a better view again. And if we want to share any of these search results, we can share them on Facebook, Twitter, we can email them. Or if you actually just want to take this tool, put it on your own website along with all the search functionality, all the functionality, complete thing, you can just get the embed code, size it to whatever screen you want on your own website, copy and paste that embed code, and just paste it into your own web page, and there you've got the whole tool for free. You can go back to um, or you can search by broad function, 339 functions. There's about 15,000 series and 2,600 agencies. But if you're new to the archive, you've got no idea what an archive is, you have definitely no idea what a government archive is, you just know that you're interested in Aboriginal affairs. Uh, specifically for, say, 1840. You can immediately see that there's one agency coming up for 1840. And hopefully by clicking on that, and that takes you to access the collection, the online catalogue, you can simply get an idea of the records for that time period, for that function. And hopefully that is an entry point to the archive that you might not have had 10 years ago as a new researcher. You might have been searching for hundreds of hours and not coming up with anything. So it's hopefully like a Google search with a keyword term and a year. Yes, there is. <laughs> it's amazing what you can find in the archives when you don't know what you're looking for. I told you it was of practical use. So it's really the ability to do a very simple search with a date, share it with anywhere on the world, on social media, email, um, embed it into your own website so you can have the tool, and just a very easy way for first time researchers to get into an archival collection without knowing how an archival collection works or is managed. When I first joined Prov 11 years ago, someone said to me, we don't actually just keep records, we keep record keeping systems. That basically blew my brain for about a day and hopefully no one has to go through that process again. They can just put in a subject. So it's almost like a topic search. Now, of course, we don't keep records according to topics, but people can do a topic search. Maybe they're interested in conservation. And they quickly see that, yes, we have records about conservation. And if they need a bit of help, here's a bit of help. It basically takes them through what they can find, what they can't find, what the circles mean, and how to share the search results. That. 
Now, is there any questions before we end up? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll take that. So if you want this right now, you can just grab the embed code, put it on your own website, and you've got the whole visualisation tool. Yeah, it's all open source. It's free. And it's definitely the step towards a federated search across Australia. Of all the academic organisations, all the archives, this can happen. It's not impossible. I didn't realise there's such a long history of it trying to happen, but not happening. So we've definitely got the technology and the ability now to move forward with this. Can you please thank all of our speakers this afternoon?